Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and forgive him? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of this, that servant released him and forgave him of that debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put in him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's pray. God, um, I pray you open our ears and our hearts to this message laid before us this morning. Would your word impact this church deeply? Um, God, we love you and thank you for your unchanging forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ethan. Well, hey, my name is Austin Smith. I'm one of the guys on staff here. Good to see you guys. And yes, it's true. They are letting the music guy do the sermon today. All right, so this is not my normal thing. I'm usually up here leading worship in some capacity, but I'm excited to get to, get to serve you guys in a new way this morning. So we have been in the book of Matthew for a very, very long time, okay? Since last year, I think September 2022, long time. But if you can rewind the clock, last week was very exciting. It was amazing. Who was here last week? Yeah, I don't wanna forget that like for a long time. But if you can rewind the clock a little bit with me to two weeks ago, we found ourselves in a passage where Jesus is teaching his disciples and he assumes something. He assumes that there will be sin. <laughs> like there will be junk, that there will be messiness relationally in the church. And specifically, he assumes that there will be times in the church when people will sin blindly. They'll sin against one another and be totally blind to the seriousness and the hurt that it causes. And so in that text, Jesus answers the question, what do you do when that happens? And Jesus, out of love for those who sin in this way and love for his church as a whole, gives very specific instructions to disciples on what they should do when that happens. And if you wanna know exactly what Jesus says, you're gonna have to go listen to two weeks ago, okay? I'm not covering that this morning. But what David did, David Livingston, not David in the Bible, David Livingston, when he taught this text is he showed us that Jesus' desire is that when someone in the church sins against us, we don't retract from them. We don't treat them as if they're dead to us, but we move towards them. We move towards them and we do all that we can to move them away from the path of darkness and back onto the path of life because we genuinely care for them. So that was the question that Jesus answered two weeks ago. But this morning, Jesus is gonna answer a different question. And that question is this, what if they do repent? Like what if a miracle happens and the Holy Spirit moves inside of them and they come to the one that they've sinned against and say, what I did was wrong. I am sorry, will you please forgive me? And what Jesus is gonna show us this morning is that how we answer that question will you please forgive me? It will say everything about who we think God is. 
It'll say everything about what we think of his mercy. See, the problem in the text that David taught two weeks ago was that there was a misrepresentation of sin, which is tragic. There was a blindness towards sin. But the problem in this text this week is worse. In this text, the problem is there is a misrepresentation of God. There is a blindness towards God and its name is unforgiveness. This room should rightly fall silent, okay? The stakes are high and I want you to feel that. If we are not forgivers, if a hunger for forgiveness and reconciliation towards others is not written into the DNA of Treeline Church, then you tell me, how can we claim to represent the greatest forgiver of all time? And here's why that's so weighty. If we're not forgivers, then our city may look at us and say, well, they're certainly not people who forgive. And they say they represent Jesus, so Jesus must not be one who forgives. And that is a very weighty thing. But here's the good news. This morning, the greatest forgiver of all time is gonna teach us to forgive. And there is no one better when it comes to forgiveness. So let's dig in our text this morning and see what Jesus has to say to us. This is Matthew 18, verse 21. It says, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? All right, so Peter is asking the question that all of us wanna know, right? There's always a question that comes up when we wanna talk about forgiveness, and that question is, when does it run out? See, Peter would have been well aware that at the time the Jewish rabbis were teaching that there was, in fact, a limit to forgiveness, and that limit was three. The common understanding amongst the rabbis was that if you committed an offense, if you wronged someone three times, you could be forgiven. But on the fourth time, forgiveness would run out for you and there will be nothing left for you but condemnation. And so Peter being Peter, if you know anything about Peter, this is classic. He gets up from the circle of the disciples, walks over to Jesus and prepares a question in his heart, thinking, you know what? I bet Jesus's capacity for forgiveness is way higher than the rabbis. Jesus is God, he's the Messiah. Three, I bet you it's seven. So he asked Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him, as many as seven times. And I'm sure what Peter was hoping Jesus would say is something like, yes, Peter, well done, my boy, gold star for you. You're right, the limit of forgiveness is seven. But that's not what happens. The response that Jesus actually gives Peter would have left him stunned. Look at Jesus' response in verse 22. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, some of your translations might say 70 times seven, and that's also a good translation. But the point that Jesus is trying to get across to Peter is not that the new limit is 77 or 70 times seven, but that there is no limit. He purposely chooses numbers that are unattainable. There is no limit. And if you consider Peter's life, how much he stumbles, how much he rejects and denies Jesus, Jesus could have easily said to Peter, look, Peter, I am never going to put a limit on forgiveness when it is asked of me. And trust me, you do not want me to. So he tells Peter, there is no limit to the forgiveness that you should be willing to give your brother. Now, Let's just stop and acknowledge together that while Jesus did answer Peter's question, the question that the answer that Jesus gave to Peter creates a whole other realm of questions in our minds, right? Like, Jesus, are you really saying that our capacity for forgiveness should be endless? Like, what about justice? Should there not be a point where our forgiveness rightly runs out and we make people face the consequences of their actions? Shouldn't there be a point where we rightly say, no, it's not okay that you hurt me? I wanna take a step back for a minute because I, we should not misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. 
There is a ton of very complex conversation about where forgiveness and justice rightly fit into our culture today. And I don't wanna let that very complex conversation distort for you what Jesus is saying here. See, we live in a day where our culture has decided that where forgiveness exists, justice cannot. In fact, our culture has said that if we want justice, there can be no forgiveness. There must be vengeance. You've gotta stay mad. And we've decided that forgiveness should be thrown out the window entirely in the name of justice. And that if justice is to prevail, then forgiveness must die. Now, before you say, amen, down with our culture in your heart, one of the reasons why our culture has swung so far this way, saying if justice is to prevail, then forgiveness must die, is because we have done a terrible job at upholding justice. In a lot of ways, we have done a terrible job upholding justice, yes, in our country, but I wanna bring this even closer to home. In a lot of ways, we have done a terrible job upholding justice in our churches. In many churches, not all, but many, we have withheld justice in the name of forgiveness. In some churches, we have told victims of abuse that they need to forgive and forget. There are churches that tragically have used forgiveness as a shield for abusers and swept abuse under the rug in order to protect the powerful, shame the abused, and silence those who are hurting. And listen, if you have been hurt by the church in this way, if that's you this morning, if you're here and you have had your abuse, your neglect or abandonment swept under the rug in the name of forgiveness by any church, you need to know that that may be their twisted understanding of what forgiveness is, but it is not God's. See, God loves justice and forgiveness, both. The idea that we must choose between forgiveness and justice, the idea that we cannot have both together, the idea that they are mutually exclusive is completely and utterly foreign to the Bible. And if we just examine God's heart through his word, we can see that God's heart is actually burning with a desire for forgiveness and justice. Look at Exodus 34, six through seven. It says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. See, God's forgiveness does not say that wrong is not wrong. In fact, the opposite is true. God's forgiveness is so powerful because he says that wrong is absolutely wrong. He stares it in the face, calls it what it is, and then says, I forgive you. And the greatest way that we can see this reality is in the cross. On the cross, we can, at the same moment, see the greatest act of forgiveness of all time and the greatest moment of justice of all time. Jesus takes the cup of God's wrath that is meant for you and for me, calls our sin and our rebellion what it is, and then takes the punishment for all of it on the cross in our place. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If we just look at the cross, we can see that Jesus loves both forgiveness and justice. And that's the kind of forgiveness that Jesus is talking about in this text. Jesus is the king of forgiveness and justice. He wants both. So now that we've cleared the fog a little bit, now that we have some biblical clarity on what Jesus means when he says forgiveness, let's look at what he says next. Look at verse 23. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, when I first was studying this text and I saw the words 10,000 talents, I thought, okay, that is obviously a lot, but I would love to know just how much that is because we don't use the term talent anymore today. So I noticed there's a footnote next to the word talent and I look down and I find the footnote at the bottom of the page and it says this. A talent 
was a monetary unit worth about 20 years wages for a labor. So I, got, so I thought, okay, let's see if I can just figure this out. Let's see if I can figure out a conservative estimation of what that amount would be in our day. Let's just say I work at Chick-fil-A and I make $15 an hour. If I make $15 an hour, some of you math wizards are gonna be doing this as I say this, that's fine, go ahead, check my math. <laughs> if I make $15 an hour, I work eight hours per day, five days a week, and I work all 52 weeks out of the year, then before any deductions, I would make $31,200. But a talent was worth 20 years worth of wages for a laborer. So if you multiply 31,200 by 20, you get $624,000 even. Now, that is one talent. And the servant in this parable owes the king 10,000 talents. So what do you get if you multiply 624,000 by 10,000? 6.24 billion dollars. The servant, in modern terms, owes the king $6.24 billion. So the question that's in our minds is how in the world is that possible? (laughs) $6.24 billion. Like there is no way that this servant could have amassed a debt so huge. And a lot of commentators that I've read on this text, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out like how in the world this servant could have possibly put himself into such a huge debt. And some have ideas, but really, no one can figure it out in the world. No one can figure out how in the world this could possibly happen. And actually, that's okay. Because what exactly the servant did to get himself in a debt is not really the point. In fact, Jesus doesn't mention it at all. All that Jesus says is that the servant owes the king an astronomical debt. Now, remember, Jesus is not telling Peter this parable just to tell him a story. Jesus is telling Peter this parable because he wants to teach Peter something about the kingdom of God. He's saying, look, Peter, just like this servant owes his king an astronomical debt, you owe God, your king, an astronomical debt. And listen, what Jesus is teaching Peter also applies to you and to me. We owe our king, God, an incredible debt. And listen, we need to get this. If we don't understand the weight of the debt that you and I owe God because of our sin and because of our rebellion against him, this parable will not be powerful to us. Listen, the debt that you and I owe God because of our sin is infinite. And maybe you're here this morning And you're thinking to yourself, well, I really don't think that my debt towards God is infinite. Like I haven't sinned an infinite amount of times. Like I really haven't done a whole lot of bad things in my life. Sure, maybe I've lied, maybe I've been prideful at times, or maybe I've treated people poorly at times, but I really haven't done anything all that bad. I haven't done anything too crazy. Like I haven't robbed anyone, I haven't murdered anyone. In fact, I feel like I've been generally a pretty good person. I think I'm generally a kind person. I like to help people. I've been to church a ton. Like, I really don't think that I've racked up a huge debt towards God because of my sin, because I haven't sinned infinite times. Listen, this is so important for us to understand this morning. The debt that you and I owe God because of our sin is so great, not because of the magnitude of our sins, but because of the magnitude of the one that we have sinned against. In other words, It's not about the value of our wrongs. It's about the value of the one that we have wronged. And when you sin, even one time against an infinitely holy God, you rack up an infinite debt. Now, let's just acknowledge that sounds crazy. But if you think about the way that our world actually works, it doesn't sound crazy at all. This is the best illustration that I could think of. Allow me to just paint myself in a bad light for a minute. Imagine that for whatever reason, right now, evil just wells up inside of me and I decide in my heart, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna trip Adam Wolber. (laughs) Sorry, Adam. 
The bigger they are, the harder they fall. I bet this will be so funny. So I finish the sermon, I step down off the stage, the service is over, and I go and I wait behind a corner waiting for Adam to come by. And when he does, I do it. I stick my foot out and I trip him and he falls in a glorious cascade and there's this loud thud and I think it's amazing. Now, I would never do that. I love Adam. He's a good friend of mine. And also, he's just way bigger than me. So this would not be safe for me at all. But what, if I did do that, what do you think would happen to me? Like, maybe Adam gets up and he just says, dude, what the heck, you know, haha, whatever. Or, I don't know, maybe he's mad, whatever. Maybe other people see me trip him and they think way less of me. Or maybe Aubrey, his wife, finds out about it and comes to his defense and says, that's my husband, how dare you? there would be some consequences for sure, but nothing too crazy, right? At least I would hope not. But let's take this up about a million notches, okay? Imagine that evil wells up inside of me once again, and I decide in my heart, you know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna trip Taylor Swift. So I buy a concert ticket. I find a way to get past security. I wait patiently for my opportunity. And when it arrives, I sprint onto the stage during her performance and I do it. I trip Taylor Swift. Can you imagine what would happen to me? Like I would probably go to jail for a while for assault or something, but the real consequence, the Swifties would descend upon me. All right, thousands and thousands of people saw this and recorded it on their phones. It would go viral. I would get death threats. I would probably, want to, I would probably be one of the most hated men in America. The consequences would be so great because Taylor Swift is regarded so highly by people in our world, especially the Swifties. All right, but if I trip Adam Wolber, there may be some consequences, but if I trip Taylor Swift, I may die. In our world, the higher the esteem of the person that you wrong, the greater the consequences usually will be. If you hurt the president of the United States, I don't care what your opinion is of him, you will face serious consequences because of the esteem and the power of the office that he holds. And this is the point. If we think that our sin is not a big deal, really what that reveals is not just that we don't understand how much we've sinned, but that we do not understand who God is. This is Isaiah 6, three through five. It says, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is our God. So what happens when you wrong that king? The answer is you owe an infinite debt that you can never pay back. The $6.24 billion that the servant owes the king in this story, child's play. If we sin against the king of heaven, we owe an infinite debt that we can never pay back. And we can see this in the next part of the parable. Look at verse 25. It says, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. There was no way that this servant could ever pay this debt. It's too great. He does not have that kind of money and he can never get that kind of money. So the king says to the servant, since you do not have the money and since you have no way of getting it, you and your whole family are gonna work the rest of your lives in order to pay off this debt. And that's not even gonna cover it. So if you're the servant, what do you do? Like you definitely don't have the money to pay the king back. And even if you and your whole family work the rest of your lives, you will still never be able to work enough to pay off this debt. So what do you do? Jesus tells us what the servant did in verse 26. It says, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. 
with a debt that was bigger than he could ever imagine, hanging over his head and no way out. The servant has one and only one thing to do. He falls. It says he fell on his knees and he humbly asked the king, have patience with me. Like put yourself in this picture, the king seated high on his throne, high and lifted up. The $6.24 billion, child's play. You owe him everything. He owes you nothing. And so you lay on the floor in front of his throne sobbing because you can never pay the infinite debt that you owe the king. And the king has every right to make you pay for that debt forever. And so you cry out, please have mercy on me. And you lay there crying. And then suddenly you feel a hand on your shoulder and it's the king. Look at what the king does in verse 27. It says, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. The king steps down from his throne, gets down on the servant's level and chooses to identify with him in that moment. And so he forgives him the debt. And he says, you owe me no more. You are free. And I've got to ask, do you realize what just happened? The debt that the servant owed did not just vanish. The king paid the debt himself. When you owe a debt to someone and they cancel the debt, it does not mean that the debt just vanishes into thin air. It means someone else paid the debt instead of you. This is incredible. Remember how much the servant owed the king? Like what could possibly cause the king to absorb the debt that this servant owes? It is crazy. And the answer, something happens to the heart of a king. We can see this happen at the beginning of the verse that we just read. It says, out of pity for him, the king released him and forgave him the debt. And the Greek word that is translated as pity here literally means to have your heart go out. To identify with them. In other words, the king in the deepest way possible was moved with compassion and mercy. Now, to the Christian in the room, do you realize that this is your life? Like you're the servant. You owed God a debt that you could never pay back no matter how hard you tried because you sinned against an infinitely holy God. And you didn't just sin once, but you sinned over and over and over again your entire life. And then one day, God in his kindness revealed to you how great the debt was that you owed because of your sin. And you put your faith in Jesus. And with your face on the floor, you said, have mercy on me. And then Jesus, the king, steps down from his throne and said, you're not gonna pay anything. I am gonna pay all of it. And he did not just pay with anything. He paid with his life. This is why Jesus Christ is the greatest forgiver of all time. Instead of making us pay the astronomical debts that we owe because of our sin, he pays our debts himself on the cross. And that is what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not just emotionally moving on from hurt. No, to forgive is to look at the debt that someone owes you. And not just a monetary debt, but an emotional debt a social debt, a moral debt. It's to look at the debt square in the face, be moved with compassion for them. And then instead of making them pay the debt, you pay the debt yourself, you forgive them. Now, forgiveness is found in an abundance in the heart of Jesus. But as we're gonna see in the ending of this story, the tragedy with our hearts is that sometimes even when we have tasted and seen this beautiful beautiful forgiveness, it doesn't light our hearts with a burning passion that wants to forgive others, but our hearts stay cold. Our hearts stay dark, cold, 
and unforgiving. And we can see this tragic reality play out in the rest of the story. The story does not end well. Look at verse 28. It says, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. The servant who has just been forgiven an incredible debt and has been shown incredible mercy by the king should now go and be like this merciful king but he doesn't, he acts like an evil king. He misrepresents the king who just forgave him and he acts like an evil king that knows nothing of the good king. He goes to his fellow servant who owes him only a hundred denarii, which is pennies on the dollar compared to what this servant owed the merciful king and he physically chokes him and says, pay what you owe. Instead of being like the merciful king and absorbing his fellow servant's debt himself, he holds the servant's debt against him and says, pay up. What a tragedy. What a tragedy that this servant's heart was not utterly changed by the forgiveness that he had received. See, there are two subtle yet dangerous things that this servant does that leads him to having an unforgiving heart that is unchanged. And if we're not careful, these things can happen in us as well. And I wanna show you these two things. I wanna show you two things that we can see happening in the servant's heart. And we'll call them two easy ways to be an unforgiving person. All right, these are important to write down if you're taking notes. Number one, how to be an unforgiving person. Exclude your offenders from the community of humans and exclude yourself from the community of sinners. I'll say it again. Exclude your offenders from the community of humans and exclude yourself from the community of sinners. When we don't wanna forgive someone, One of the things that we do, one of the things the servant did is we choose to see them only how we want to see them. All that we want to think about and remember are the worst parts about them. All that you wanna do is think of this person as someone who's wronged me. We wanna caricature them. Have you ever had a caricature drawn of you at the fair? You sit down and they draw a picture of you and they emphasize your features that are the most obvious in the moment, right? I got a big forehead. Forehead. If I sat down, they'd probably draw me with a big forehead. I would would hate the picture. But that is what a caricature artist does. And when you don't wanna forgive someone, this is what you do. You replay their offense to you over and over and over again until their offense is so huge in your mind that you are no longer able to see anything but the offense. They're no longer a human being made in the image of God to you. All that they are is what they've done to you. So you exclude them from the community of humans who are made in the image of God and just as worthy of honor and dignity as you are. But then in the same breath, you exclude yourself from the community of sinners. Listen, if you want to remain an unforgiving person, refuse to identify with your offender. Forget all the times that you have hurt someone. Remember no more the times that you have offended people. If you wanna be someone who is unforgiving, exclude your offenders from the community of humans, but then in the same breath, exclude yourself from the community of sinners. So if you wanna remain an unforgiving person, do those things. But how do we be forgiving?
I just realized that I missed one. There's one more thing. Yes, you're getting two, not just one. One more thing, if you wanna be an unforgiving person, this is number two. Enjoy the power of unforgiveness. There is power in unforgiveness because you can say even to your brother or sister who asks humbly for forgiveness, no, I'm never gonna pay that debt. I'm gonna make you pay it. You enjoy the feeling of watching other people pay their own debts and you might disguise yourself you might disguise yourself as one who seeks justice, but what you really want in your heart is vengeance. You wanna watch them suffer under the weight of the debt that they owe you because they have wronged you. You enjoy the moral high ground. You enjoy the mountain where you love to be the one who has been wronged and you love to look down and watch the person who has wronged you suffer at the bottom of the mountain. Now, back to what I said earlier. How do you be a person who forgives? If you wanna be a person who forgives, do what the king does and not what the servant does. So what does the king do? There are two things that the king does to forgive. And I'll tell you them as two steps that you need to take in order to be a forgiving person. One, be moved with compassion and mercy for your offenders. When someone offends you, don't stay high up on your throne. Get down low to the ground with this person and admit that you belong there with them. Identify with them. See that they need mercy and compassion just like you do. So that's the first step. Be moved with compassion and mercy for your offenders. Here's the second step. I promise I didn't miss one this time. And this is the hardest part. Release them from their debt. This is the hardest part. Instead of holding this debt against them for how they've wronged you, instead of saying, pay what you owe, look at this person and say, you are free. You're not gonna pay this debt, I am. Listen, this is why forgiveness is so hard because to forgive is to suffer. To forgive someone means that you must willingly suffer instead of them. You pay their debt yourself. You remember the cross where Jesus, instead of saying, pay what you owe, says, you are not gonna pay that debt, I am. And he pays for your infinite debt in full with his life. And if you are unable to remember how Jesus paid that debt for you and you remain with a cold, unforgiving heart towards others, you need to seriously ask yourself this question. Do you actually know this king? Do you actually know Jesus? Because how can you not be changed by the greatest forgiver of all time when he pays your debt for you? And the story of this parable ends grimly. Finally, let's look at how this verse ends in verse 31. It says, when his fellow servants saw what he had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his debt. And look at what he says next. Jesus has finished the parable and he tells Peter this. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is a scary passage. Listen, the point of the ending of this text is not just that the servant did not forgive, but that he still had an unforgiving heart. 
And because he was unwilling to extend to his fellow servant the mercy that the king had extended to him, it revealed that he had never actually opened his heart to the king's mercy in the first place. And instead of becoming like a merciful king, he became like an evil king. Treeline, may that not be true of us. If we say we know the good king, we must be like him, not evil kings. Let the forgiveness and the mercy of the good king turn our hearts into storehouses of mercy and forgiveness for those who wrong us. And when someone owes us a debt, let us forgive them and pay their debts ourselves because the gospel compels us to. It's what our good king has done for us. Let's pray.